Hey, what is up guys? In this video, I'm going to share with you five basic yet important financial ratios that will elevate your investing game in no time. That is because for any fundamental or just any business analysis, ratios are far more useful than just looking at the absolute numbers on the financial statements as you are able to express something and form an educated guess out of it to help with your investment thesis. But just before we begin, a quick thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm will be very appreciated. Thank you for that. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. The first and the most basic ratio you will need under your belt is the earnings per share EPS ratio, which comes with the formula of net income minus dividends divided by average outstanding shares. This ratio tells us how profitable a company is for each share of its stock and the higher a company's EPS, the more profitable the company is considered to be. If a company's EPS is higher, investors may be more willing to pay for a company's stock if they think the company is making higher profits relative to its share price. So ideally, for any companies that you are investing in, you would want the numerator which is earnings to increase and also for the denominator, the number of shares outstanding to decrease so that your EPS is higher. Pretty simple, right? But just for your information, the denominator doesn't change that often unless there's share buyback or share dilution, which may change from time to time, yes, but not as fast as the company's earnings. And like most of the other ratios that we are going to talk about today, EPS is best used when comparing companies versus its competitors in the same field or industry. For example, if you are looking at Apple's EPS, which is a tech company, you would ideally want to compare it with the likes of other tech companies such as Google, Microsoft and Amazon. Take for example, if company A and B both have $10 million in net profit, but company A only has 1 million shares outstanding, whereas company B has 5 million shares outstanding. That means company A has an EPS of $10 per share, while company B has an EPS of $2. So comparing both of them side by side, we can conclude that company A is 5 times more profitable than company B. Now let's use Tesla as an example. In 2021, Tesla's annual net income was $5.52 billion. And since Tesla does not distribute dividends to its investors, that will be zero. In the same year, Tesla had 1.12 billion of outstanding shares. So from this, we can take 5.52 billion dollars minus zero dividends, then divide it by 1.12 billion shares, which will net us about 4.92 dollars, which is our EPS. In this scenario, we can directly compare Tesla with other competitors in terms of profitability. So just to make your life easier, you can actually just find this EPS data on Yahoo Finance or Morningstar or Finviz. They should have a section under the PL statement that shows basic and diluted EPS. The calculations we just did earlier was all diluted EPS, whereas basic EPS is slightly different, whereby the denominator the number of shares outstanding does not include any potential dilution due to employee stock options, convertible securities, treasury shares, and etc. But anyways, without confusing you, just go for the diluted EPS which is technically the better measure out of the two. So from our previous calculation, we know that for year 2021, Tesla had an EPS of $4.92 and after searching on Morningstar for its competitor, you will find that Ford had an EPS of $4.45. Toyota had $14.86, Volkswagen had $3.50, NIO had negative $6.72, and Xpeng had $2.96, Rivian had negative $22.98, and General Motor had $6.70 EPS. So from here, you can see Tesla's EPS is not necessarily higher than Toyota or GM in 2021, but its share price in late 2021 reflect a market cap of $1 trillion, which is way more than all of the other automakers combined. So here comes my point. EPS is a good financial ratio to measure a company's profitability, yes, but it does come with some limitations, whereby it is unable to measure the future earnings potential from high-growing companies like, say, Tesla Cybertruck and full self-driving software fair profit. So the market is pricing Tesla at a way premium price for its future earnings potential rather than basing on its earnings today. And speaking of that, this is the perfect segue for me to talk about the second financial ratio that you need to know and that is the price to earnings PE ratio. To calculate the PE ratio, we can use the formula market value per share divided by earnings per share. Market value pretty simple. Just a Google search and you can get it already. Earnings per share, this is the same number I've just covered earlier. This ratio is often used by investors to determine if a company is under or overvalued 
relative to its competitors or just its own historical valuation. And unlike the previous ratio, you want to look for a lower number when it comes to PE ratio. The lower the price to earnings, the better it is for you as you are getting a better deal on a profitable company by paying less for it. Let's take Tesla again as an example. Previously, we saw that Tesla's EPS was $4.92 for the year ending 2021. So if we were to calculate its PE ratio on that day, we should ideally look for its share price dated 31st December 2021. And that will be $1,056.78 per share. Now take that number divided by EPS of $4.92, we will get a PE ratio of 214.8. That means investors are actually paying a 214 times premium to its earnings. Now for reference, some Experts recommend a PE ratio of 20 to 25 for a stock, but according to the data by New York University, the average PE ratio for the automotive and truck industry is 65 times. So does that mean Tesla's 214 times is really, really overvalued? Well, yes and no. Yes, if you look at it from a historical value investing perspective, it is way overvalued. However, no, because this viewpoint doesn't take into account other factors such as Tesla's business mode in the automotive, battery and energy industry, unique selling points, scalability, growth potential, and etc. So investors actually realized that PE ratio may not be the best metric to value a stock. So they actually came up with a variation to it in the form of forward PE and trailing PE ratio, whereby they look forward the earnings for the next 12 months or the previous 12 months instead of their current reported earnings. So in a way, it's more accurate because next 12 months is actually more feasible and can be accomplished rather than pinning hope onto their earnings 5 or 10 years later, right? And to make your life simpler, you can simply go to Finway's website and they should have all the metrics that you need over there. And just for the record, you can see that Tesla's PE today is about 181 times, but its forward PE ratio is actually 53 times. So there you go. That is the huge contrast between current versus forward PE because PE ratio in itself is a lagging indicator. Anyways, that's it for the PL statement. There are, of course, many more ratios like gross margin, operating margin, pack ratio, EV EBITDA, etc which are all important as well, but I will save that for another day so that you won't be overwhelmed by all of the information I have for you in this video. So let's look at the third financial ratio, which is the debt to equity DE ratio that you can find on the company's balance sheet. The DE ratio is calculated with the formula of total liabilities divided by total shareholders equity. What that means is the ratio is able to tell you how much does the company owe in total in comparison to how much the company's shareholders own. And common sense would tell you, a higher DE ratio means the company has more liabilities in the form of debt and loans etc. Which also means the company has a higher leverage amount, which also translates to a higher risk factor. For example, company A has $1 million in debt and $10 million in the equity. That gives them a DE ratio of 1 divided by 10, 0.1. On the other end, company B has $1 million in debt as well, but they only have $2 million in their equity. That essentially means they have a DE ratio of 0.5. So in layman terms, if there is any recession or any disruption in their revenue, company A has a much lower risk of facing financial issues compared to company B because company B has a lot of debt and that debt will translate to higher interest expense. So the room for them to wiggle is significantly smaller they need to have that constantly strong revenue to sustain that debt. But that is what investors should take note of because any highly leveraged companies like company B come with a higher risk factor as they are pinning a lot of hope on their ability to generate and sustain that revenue amount. And if they don't, investors will be the first one to run away from them, which is why you will see smaller or younger companies have more volatile share prices because most of them require a lot of debt to fund their business growth. That's the same concept with your mortgage or car loan. Say if your monthly income comes at $4,000 per month, it will be riskier to take on a $3,000 mortgage as compared to a $1,000 monthly mortgage, right? Yep, that is exactly the same idea because lower mortgage payment also means lower DE ratio, aka lower risk for you. And to make your life easier, you can actually go back to the Finwiz website that I shown you just now. You should be able to find the DE ratio. 
and in this case you can see that Tesla's debt to equity ratio is 0.14 which means they are actually very low in terms of leverage there are no hard and fast rules as to what is the best DE ratio because too much of it means you are taking on too much risk and too little of it can also mean you are not taking enough risk to grow your business to each of its own personally I would prefer for the D ratio to be below 1.0 because any more than that means there is a probability of defaulting loan payments but obviously if you can couple lower DE ratio with cash rich company like Tesla and Apple then that will be the best case scenario so to bring more meaning to your DE ratio try comparing them with the peers or competitors in the same industry for example Ford has a DE ratio of three times GM has a DE ratio of 1.77 times Hopefully that gives you a good picture as to which company is actually taking on more risk in order to outcompete each other. Now let's look at another financial ratio that gives you a better idea on how well the company makes money, the return on equity, ROE in short. The ROE can be calculated by taking net income and divided by the average shareholder's equity. The numerator, the net income, you can easily find on the P&L statement, whereas for the denominator, average shareholders equity it's actually the average equity amount of any particular year investors love to use this formula to determine how well a company performs financially with shareholders money obviously the higher the roe the more efficient or profitable a company is with their business model and just like how you would calculate your own return on investment roi a positive ROE is definitely a good thing for any businesses as they are able to generate more money out of the $1 that they are investing, which is what we are all trying to do with our money, right? Anyways, let's use Tesla again for this example. As we have established earlier, Tesla's net profit for 2021 was $5.52 billion. Their average shareholders' equity in 2021 amounts to $31.015 billion. So if we take these figures and place them in the formula, we will get 17.8%. That means for every $1 that Tesla spends or invests, they will get $1.178 back. And for the record, experts typically agree that a 15-20% to is considered a good ROE. Anyways, let's take a look at Tesla's competitors again in 2021. Ford's ROE was 9.8%. Toyota's ROE was 12.32% and GM's ROE was 16.5%. So in terms of ROE, we can clearly see that Tesla has outperformed all of its competitors. Or in other words, Elon Musk and his team is able to generate more return for their shareholders. Hence, that is part of the reason why Tesla is able to attract more investment in comparison to its competitors. The last but not the least important financial ratio that I have for you today is the quick ratio or some call it the acid test ratio. It comes with the formula of cash and cash equivalents plus current receivables plus short term investments divided by current liabilities all of which information can be found in the balance sheet as well. I know the formula can be a little bit intimidating, but to simplify it for you, it simply means the total amount of money a company has in the short term in comparison to the short term debts that they have, i.e. their ability to pay down any short term debt obligations. For example, if today a company suddenly stops operating their business, or in Tesla's case, suddenly all of their Giga factory explodes and they have to pay down all of their debt. So this quick ratio is able to test whether Tesla's current balance sheet is able to pay down their short-term debt or not. And that can be money from Tesla's bank account, chasing for all the payments from people that owe them and selling off all of their short-term investments in bonds or stocks or whatever. Then that amount of money that they can gather, usually within 12 months, if that amount exceeds all of their short-term debts within 12 months, then they essentially have a quick ratio of more than 1.0 because they are able to pay down all of their short-term debt obligations. Another example, say you have a car loan that needs to be settled this year and that amounts to $50,000 and for some reason you stop working today and there's no more income. So you sell off all of your stocks combined with your cash in your bank accounts and whatnot and that all sums up to a total of say $150,000. So your quick ratio is actually $150,000 divided by $50,000 equals to 3.0. That means you have three times the ability to pay down all of your short-term obligations, which is obviously a good thing. There are of course pros and cons with this quick ratio because yes, it can let you know how much money a company have to pay down its short-term obligations, but 
it may not be the best way to measure a company's financial soundness or operational efficiency because it does not consider the company's ability to generate future cash flows and also it does not take into account long-term debts which could be a few times more than their short-term debts so remember to take note of that but that said in my opinion it's more of a risk profiling metric whereby you can quickly see what's the risk profile of any given company in comparison with its competitors especially in an uncertain market like right now where the global economy can fall anytime soon and demand could easily be crushed in a matter of few months. So wrapping up this video, the five financial ratios that I've just shared with you are essential for your fundamental analysis, but it is by no means the five only ratios that you need to know. There are a ton more financial ratios that can give you many more ideas, but these five should be a good starting ground for you, especially if you are new to the stock market. And trust me when I say this, people pay for this knowledge, but I'm doing it for free anyways. And speaking of that, if you haven't checked out my previous 45 minutes long video where I dissect all the fundamental knowledge that you need to know as an investor, I will leave a link up here at the top right corner and down below as well. So feel free to check it out. I'm sure you will love it. Okay, that's all for this video. Thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next one.